Good evening, everyone. Where are my captions? Where are my captions? Oh. As always, I forgot. All right, well, we'll get it. No big deal. There we go. That should fix it. Yeah. Yeah. Quick, easy fix. All right, so we are up to the final chapter and um, the appendix of this book. Um, I think total that gives us 30 pages. And I don't see any reason to screw around. Let's just jump straight on into it and find out if there's any theory in here about the kingdom of the Neanderthals. Um or is it the bait and switch? I think it is. Because so far, <laughs> there hasn't been much in the way of uh, Atlantis or Neanderthals. So, here we go. Chapter 12, The Old Ones. One morning in July 1989, a group of Israeli archaeologists led by Professor Nama Goran Inbar... Uh, were excavating in the Jordan Valley and a mechanical digger had carved out two deep trenches to expose the geological profile of the site. Each shovelful of earth was dumped on the ground and searched for bones or artifacts. But one shovelful contained a wholly unexpected find. It was a part of a planed and polished wooden plank ten inches long and half as wide. It had obviously been ripped out of a larger plank, and the digger had cracked it across the middle. On its lower side, the plank was slightly con convex and had obviously not been planed or polished. What was, so odd about the, what was so odd about this find? Only that the layer from which it 
came was a half a million years old, the time of Peking man, who belonged to a species of early man, the first true man called Homo erectus. Presumably their brain was about half the size of modern man's, yet they had made this polished plank, which Professor Gorin Inbar confessed herself unable to explain. There is a photograph of it in Michael Bejant's book Ancient Traces, which is fortunate since when Bejant rang Dr. Gorin Inbar, there was only one single transparency of it in existence. It was just as well he included the photograph, for the plank has since been destroyed, accidentally of course, by the Conservation Department of Hebrew University. This in itself sounds unbelievable. Destroyed? A piece of wood that could be one of the most important finds in modern archaeology? After all, it could support the suggestion made in the last chapter that if Homo erectus could build a raft to carry his family to the island of Flores about 800,000 years ago, he must have been far more intelligent than we give him credit for. Richard Rudgley of the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford expresses the problem succinctly. Quote, Preconceived opinions have repeatedly led to the rejection of evidence that does not fit with present dogmas. This has led to the routine acceptance of Upper Paleolithic engraved bone from the Hayonim cave in Israel and the equally routine rejection of an engraved bone of Middle Paleolithic age from the same site. Even through the Middle Paleolithic, bone has been ex has more extensive markings than its Upper Paleolithic counterpart. End quote. The Upper Paleolithic Paleolithic dates from 40,000 years ago to 10,000, the Middle Paleolithic from 200,000 to 40,000. This sounds like madness, to reject an engraved bone because man is not supposed to have been, able, been capable of engraving before 40,000 years ago. Surely it would be more sensible to consider revising the dogma. Although Rudgley is an orthodox archaeologist, his book, Lost Civilizations of the Stone Age, is full of similar examples. One of the most striking is about the group of stars called the Pleiades, or Seven Sisters, in Taurus. These, he points out, are known as the Seven Sisters by native peoples of North America, Siberia, and Australia. This can hardly be coincidence, but if it is not coincidence then it's sim that it implies that, uh, that they were called the seven sisters <coughs> sorry <coughs> sorry about that um it implies that they were called the seven sisters before the peopling of australia which is now dated at 40,000 years ago and this is far too early for most arch anthropologists actually i th was taught that it was 50 to 60,000 years ago, but whatever. Um, even more awkward is the contention of Peter Kershaw of Monash University, Victoria, that Australia may have been peopled 140,000 years ago. His theory is based on the fact that there was a sudden rise in charcoal levels 140,000 years ago, and an equal equally sudden decline in pollen levels, both of which Kershaw thinks may have been due to human beings using fire. A discovery made in 1996 is even more disturbing. A team led by Dr. Leslie Head of the University of Wulongong, Western Australia, discovered, according to the Times of September 23, 1996, quote, tools used to make rock art and enormous sculpted boulders believed to be up to 176,000 years ago, end quote, at a site in Jinmium, Western Australia, in which case our ancestors may have been calling the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters, for almost 200,000 years. But even 40,000 years ago is embarrassing, 
enough for it suggests that our ancestors were studying the stars when they were supposed to be living in caves and hitting animals with clubs. In Hamlet's Mill, Giorgio de Santillana and Hertha von Deschend uh, argue that star lore predates civilization and that before history, someone had already named the constellations. But what did Santillana mean by before history? He seems to have meant before about 8000 BC, by which time Homo sapiens had arrived. The Seven Sisters also receive a lengthy discussion in Stan Gooch's Cities of Dreams, subtitled The Rich Legacy of ne Neanderthal Man Which Shaped Our Civilization. When I first read Cities of Dreams, in the year of its publication, 1989, I was called, I was rather baffled. Gooch was arguing that Neanderthal man had possessed a complex civilization, but that it was not a civilization of bricks and mortar, but of dreams. That hardly seemed to make sense. Surely civilization is our defense against nature. Dreams are not much use against a hurricane or a saber-toothed tiger. I was impressed by his observation that Neanderthal man had dug an immense red ochre mine a hundred thousand years ago, but surely that alone did not constitute civilization. Sorry. Um, but looking at the book more recently, I was struck by the opening lines of the dust jacket blurb. Quote, the book challenges the orthodox view that Nothing worth the name of civilization existed prior to the last ice age and the subsequent emergence of modern man some 30,000 years ago, end quote. This sounded very much like Hapgood's assertion about 100,000-year-old science. Gooch launches his argument by comparing Neanderthal man with Native Americans. Quote, prior to 2000 B.C., these varied people of North America knew weaving, tent and weapon making, medicine, music, and many other skills. They also had by then a complex political life alongside rich culture and religious traditions and great bodies of ancient folklore. Some of the tribes spent much of each day, every day, in complex religious ritual, not unlike Orthodox Jews and Muslims of our present day. Yet we must emphasize these same complex Indians had no written language, nor did they build any permanent b dwellings. End quote. What would have happened, Gooch says, if they had been exterminated by disease or some catastrophe and had simply vanished? Archaeologists would find their skeletons and dismiss them as primitives. We now know that this primitiveness of Native Americans was largely self-chosen. They not only lived close to nature, they believed that they had a symbiotic relationship with nature. In From Atlantis to the Sphinx, I devoted many pages to the Hopi and the Quiche, whose civilization is as shamanistic as that of Narbi's uh, Quirishari. Uh, the anthropologist Edward Hall gradually came to understand their way of life and to recognize that it is a complete alternative to Western civilization. In many ways, the Quiche calendar, for example, it is far more rich and complex than our Western way of life. It would not be inaccurate to call it a right-brained civilization that was, has chosen to develop along its own lines. Speaking of the Seven Sisters, Gooch remarks, the Pleiades, uh, quote, the Pleiades are the only constellation noted and named by every culture on earth, past and present, from the most advanced to the most primitive, end quote. Then he points out the similarity of the legends of Australian Aborigines, Wyoming Indians, and the ancient Greeks. In the Greek legend, Orion the Hunter pursues the six maidens and their mother through the forest until Zeus takes pity on them and changes them all, including Orion, into stars. 
In the Australian legend, the hunter is called Waruna, and he captures two of the seven maidens. But these escape up trees that suddenly grow up, uh, grow until they reach the sky, where all the maidens live forever. According to the Wyoming Indians, the seven sisters are pursued by a bear and climb up a high rock, which grows until it reaches the sky. In 1989, Gooch pointed out that there is a 20,000-year gap between the Australian Aborigines and the Wyoming Indians, unaware at the time that modern anthropologists would soon extend this to 40,000. Gooch goes on to mention that the Seven Sisters play an equally important role in the legend of the Aztecs, the Incas, the Polynesians, the Chinese, the Maasai, the Kikuyu, the Hindus, and the ancient Egyptians. This worldwide interest in the Pleiades, um, he argues, surely indicates that it originated in some very early and once central culture. In Gucci's view, the culture was Neanderthal. We may doubt this and prefer to believe that it was our own ancestor, Cro-Magnon, but Gooch certainly has accumulated some impressive evidence of the intellectual sophistication of Neanderthal man. He speaks, for example, of a find made at Drachenloch in the Swiss Alps, where a 75,000-year-old bear altar was discovered in a cave. In a rectangular stone chest, whose lid was a massive stone slab, archaeologists found seven bear skulls, with their muzzles pointed toward the cave entrance. At the back of the cave, there were niche, niches in the wall, niches in the wall, with six more bear skulls. Now, s seven, as we have seen, is a number associated with shamanism. The Drachenloch cave was clearly a ritual place, in effect, a church. Moreover, as Eliad tells us, there is a worldwide connection between the bear and the moon. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Although when I look at it, I see a buffalo. But anyway. Um, and this might have been guessed from the fact that the number of skulls in the cave was 13, the number of lunar months in the year. This and many other clues led Gooch to infer that the religion of Neanderthal man was based on moon worship, and Neanderthals were the first stargazers. He argues that among such, among much else, the knowledge of procession of the equinoxes noted by Santiana probably originated with Neanderthal man. A church implies a priest or shaman, and so another part of the jigsaw puzzle falls into place. Neanderthal man must have had his shaman's magicians who played an imp Wait a minute, let me start over. Neanderthal man must have had his shamans, magicians who played an important part in the hunting rituals, as shamans do worldwide. Is it chance that the moon goddess is Diana the Huntress? Is she perhaps also a legacy from Neanderthal man? Since Gooch's book came out in 1989, new evidence has accumulated indicating that Neanderthal man also possessed technology. In 1996, it was announced that scientists from Tarragona's Roviri Evergili Wow, uh, University had unearthed 15 furnaces near Capillades, uh, north of Barcelona. Professor Eudald Carbonel, Carbonet uh, stated that they proved that Neanderthal man possessed a skill level far more advanced than anyone had had, possessed, had supposed. Homo sapiens, he said, were not an evolutionary leap beyond Cro-Magnon man, but only a gentle step from Neanderthal. Each of the furnaces served a different function according to its size, some ovens, some hearths, even blast furnaces. 
The team also discovered an astonishing variety of stone and bone tools, as well as the most extensive traces of wooden utensils. One of the of Gucci's most amazing statements is that in South Africa, Neanderthal man was digging deep mines to obtain red ochre a hundred thousand years ago. Quote, one of the largest sites evidenced the removal of a million kilos of ore. End quote. Other mines were discovered dated 45,000, 40,000, and 35,000 years ago. In all cases, the site had been painstakingly filled in again, presumably because the earth was regarded as sacred. Neanderthal man seems to have used the red ochre for realistic, uh, realistic, ritualistic purposes, including burial. In 1950, Dr. Ralph Selecki of the Smithsonian Institute had had excavated the Shanadar cave in Iraqi Kurdistan and discovered evidence of ritualistic burial by Neanderthals, in which the dead had been covered with a quilt of woven wildflowers. His book, Shanidar, is subtitled The Humanity of Neanderthal Man. He was the first of many anthropologists to conclude that Neanderthal man was far more than an ape. Gooch points out that red ochre has been in use since at least 100,000 years ago until today, when it is still used by Australian Aborigines. He quotes one authority who calls it, quote, the most spiritually rich and magical of all substances, end quote. Red ochre is the oxidized form of a mineral called ma magnetite, which, as, as the name suggests, is magnetic. If a small sliver is floated on the surface tension of water, it swings around and points to magnetic north. And in 1000 BC, the Olmecs were using it as a compass needle floating on cork, a millennial before the Chinese invented the compass. Gooch points out that many creatures, including pigeons, have a cluster of magnetite in the brain, which is used for homing, and asks if it is not conceivable that Neanderthal man also had a magnetite cluster in the brain, which may have enabled him to detect hematite under the ground. This, of course, would be simply a ver variant of the power dowsers have to detect underground water. For whatever reason, Neanderthal man sought red ochre. It seemed clear that he must be credited with some kind of civilization. In January 2002, it emerged that Neanderthal man made use of a kind of superglue. It was a kind of blackish-brown pitch discovered at a lignite mining pit in the Harz Mountains, estimated to be 80,000 years old. One of the pieces bore the imprint of fingers and impressions of a flint stone tool and wood, suggesting that the pitch had served as a sort of glue to secure the wooden shaft to a flint stone blade. The pitch from a birch tree can only be produced at a temperature of 300 to 400 degrees Celsius. Professor Dietrich Mania of the Friedrich Schiller University in Jena said, or Jena said, quote, this implies that the Neanderthals did not come across these pitches by accident, but must have produced them with intent, end quote. Now clearly all this is revolutionary. We take it for granted that human culture began with Cro-Magnon man, Homo sapiens. Our Cro-Magnon ancestors began making drawings in caves about 35,000 years ago, and so we had always assumed our civilization had its first beginnings. But if, if the Pleiades were recognized 40,000 years ago, and if Gooch's arguments that the Neanderthal religion was uh, are sound about the really uh, about the Neanderthal religion are sound, then we are speaking of a far more remote period. Of course, if Leslie Head is correct about 176,000 years old, year old tools and rock sculpture in Australia, it, it would be even longer ago 
and leave little doubt that we are we were dealing with Neanderthals, and that Neanderthal man studied the heavens for our Cro-Magnon ancestors, who were still in Africa 176,000 years ago, could not have been responsible. Again, an 82,000-year-old bone flute discovered by Dr. Ivan Turk of the Slovenia Ac Academy of Sciences in 1995 demonstrates that Neanderthal man had his own music. It begins to look more and more as if Gooch's comparison of Neanderthal man to Native Americans is valid. In 26,000 year old bone sewing needle complete with the hole for thread was discovered at another Neanderthal site. Perhaps the most important proof of Neanderthal man's intelligence came about through discoveries made in the Blombus cave on the tip of South Africa. Beginning in the 1990s, the cave had been used by both Cro-Magnons and Neanderthals, but it was in the specifically Neanderthal levels that the cave, of the cave that Christ, Christopher Henschelwood of the State University of New York uncovered quantities of okra rock de decorated with geometric patterns on a prepared flattened surface. The implications of these discoveries were presented on a BBC Horizon program of February 20th, 2005, quote, The Day We Learned to Think, end quote. I guess that's the title. It began by presenting the theory of Professor Richard Klein that the cave art of 35,000 years ago represented this watershed and that it was caused by some genetic change that, we call, that he called the human revolution. But this depended on assumptions about Neanderthals that had been questioned in the last few pages, that have been questioned in the last few pages. A major step in rejecting this view was taken by Jeffrey Leitman, a professor of otolarin otolaryngology, otolaryngology, the study of the larynx, who pointed out that the larynx is in most creatures is higher than in humans, which is why their voice sounds are higher in pitch than ours. The dropping of the larynx meant a deeper voice, better adapted for speech, but this had already come about in Neanderthals at least 200,000 years ago, and it seems unlikely that they possessed the voice box for language without the ability to speak. The geometric patterns discovered by Henschelwood dated to more than 70,000 years ago. Conceivably, these may not be art, but some form of notation possibly astronomical, but the dots and line found on the 35-year-old piece of antelope bone that David Marshak of the Peabody Institute showed to be a notation of the phases of the moon created by our Cro-Magnon ancestors and cited by, by Marshak as an example of the first writing, but the patterns on the Blombus ochre may predate by 40,000 years. All of which may prove to be beside the point if we accept the evidence of a small carved statue known as the Barakat Ram figure, discovered in 1980 by the same Professor Nama Goran Inbar, who found the piece of ancient planking mentioned at the beginning of this chapter. She found it on the Golan Heights, and its age was established because it was found along with 7,500 scrapers between two layers of basalt known as tuff that could be dated, and the date was between 250,000 and 280,000 years ago. It resembles a, fam a famous Venus of Willendorf, but is far cruder, and examination under an electron microscope reveals that it was not just some odd-shaped stone, but that it had been carved by Neanderthal man. His flint tool had left powder in the grooves. Ooh. Oh, and here come the yawns. 
So Neanderthal man had carved, was carving a tiny female figure, probably the moon goddess, more than a quarter of a million years ago. The implication is that he had already developed a religion to which the bear skulls in the Drachenloch cave bear witness, but 200,000 years earlier than we had, expect, we had suspected. In Uriel's machine, Robert Lomas and Christopher Knight also turned their attention to Neanderthals and pointed out that they had larger brains than modern man, adding the startling information that they were around for 230,000 years before they vanished. Neanderthals, therefore, had plenty of time to acquire a high level of sophistication. They clearly believed in an afterlife, for they buried their dead with every sign of religious ritual and with tools and meat to supply their needs in the beyond. They buried them in cloaks covered with ornate beads with buttonholes, decorated caps, carved bracelets, and pendants. They manufactured at least one perfectly circular chalk disc, disc, which is almost certainly a moon disc. And Lomas and Knight make this important observation. Quote, it is possible that Neanderthal culture may have reached a level not unlike certain current human groups, such as the Australian Aborigines, who shun technology, preferring their old ways based upon empathy with their environment. Speaking of early human humans of 100,000 years ago, they add that if a Neanderthal child could have been snatched up by a time machine, they could have been educated through university to exactly the same level as any person in the modern world. We think of Neanderthals as ape-like creatures who communicated in grunts, but Lomas and Knight quote a scientific paper to the effect that if a Neanderthal man dressed in modern clothes walked into a New York subway, no one would give him a second glance. And if Neanderthal man conducted religious rituals, played the flute, studied the heavens, and built blast furnaces, he must have had some form of language other than grunts. In From Atlantis to the Sphinx, I was more concerned with Cro-Magnon than with Neanderthal man and consequently overlooked the significance of Neanderthal shamanism. In that book, I argued that shamanism must have played a central role in the development of civilization. If Cro-Magnon cave paintings reveal that shamanic rituals helped the hunters to track and kill their prey, the shaman must have been one of the most important people in the tribe and would inevitably have become a leader. A tradition of priest kings probably stretches from Cro-Magnon caves to ancient Sumer and Egypt, and ancient Egypt was the last great civilization in which priesthood and kingship were virtually identical. After that, the modern man began to divide himself from his instinctive self with his perplexities and doubts. In an earlier chapter, we saw how shamanic cultures seem to take a group of a kind of group consciousness for granted. The Amahuaca Indians of Brazil all sat looking at the same visions that Manuel Cordova was seeing. The boa chant brought a gigantic boa constrictor, followed by other snakes, then the birds and animals. For the same reason, Jeremy Narby's Quirishari instructor called their hallucinogen forest television. Yeah. We have all seen a flock of birds wheeling in the autumn sky and all turning simultaneously without a single bird lagging behind. We have seen a shoal of fishes in an aquarium do the same thing. Country people are intuitively aware that there is a connection between the individual members of the flock or shoal just as there is, is between bees and ants. In flocks or shoals, these creatures are not individuals but a collective ruled by a group mind while the actual cells in the body of the micro microstomum microstomum worm seems to be governed by a group mind that knows more than they do individually 
Incredibly, modern humans can still allow themselves to be governed by a group mind. In Out of Control, Kevin Kelly describes a computer conference in Las Vegas in which 5,000 people faced a giant television screen in which they could see themselves. They could also exert control over what happened on the screen by means of wands, which were red on one side and green on the other. Now the whole audience was divided into two, reds and greens, and proceeded to play electronic ping pong exactly like two individuals. And after other exercises in group activity, a flight simulator appeared on the screen in which the le left half of the audience was placed in charge of the plane's roll and the right half its pitch. 5,000 minds attempted to bring the plane in to land and when it became clear that it was not going to make it, caused it to abort the landing and try again. At one point, the whole audience, without any communication, decided spontaneously to make the plane loop-the-loop. Loop loop. Interesting. Obviously, that ancient capacity is still there, even though it has grown rather rusty in our civilized society. We're used to acting as individuals, and when a modern city dweller walks along a crowded street, he feels very little connectedness with his fellows, often the reverse. Yet a few hours exercise with a computer screen, like the one described above, can soon reestablish the sense of connectedness. According to Schwaller de Lubitz, it was, his, it was this connectedness that characterized ancient Egyptian society. I summarize his view, quote, Egyptian science, Egyptian art, Egyptian medicine, Egyptian astronomy were not seen as different aspects of Egyptian life. They were all aspects of the same thing, which was religion in its broadest sense. Religion was identical with knowledge, end quote. Schwaller expressed it, quote, over 4,000 years, ancient Egypt did not have a religion as such, it was religion in its entirety, end quote. And he italicized the last part of it, and he says my italics. It is impossible for us to grasp the meaning of a society that it is a religion in its entirety. Even modern Judaism and modern Islam have moved far from their original roots in which society and religion were the same thing. In ancient societies, it was the very substance of everyday life, even hunting, and therefore eating, depended on it. Neither Neanderthal nor Cro-Magnon man could have conceived life without religion. What do we actually know of Neanderthal man? To begin with, he was about a foot shorter than we are, and his large brain made the back of his head bulge out like a squid. This bulge was due to Neanderthal's much larger, larger cerebellum, a brain organ about which we understand very little, but which is involved in dreaming. Hence, Gucci's title, City of, Cities of Dreams. Moreover, he was almost certainly left-handed, since most late, later cave art was produced by left-handers. Gucci see, sees that, that as extremely important, since physiologists begin to, began to study the brain, it has been established that left-handed people are more intuitive than right-handers. I was suddenly reminded of Gucci's work on Neanderthal man when reading Joseph Needham's introduction to Robert Temple's book, The Genius of China. Needham seemed to, came to research his immense science and civilization in China when he was in Chungking during the Second World War. The reason no one had ever thought of doing such a thing before was quite simple. Quote, My friends among the older generation of sinologists had thought that we would find nothing. Um, exactly the same story as the Neanderthal man. Instead, what cave of glittering treasures was opened up? End quote. He learned that far from being uninventive, the Chinese had invented practically everything from binomials to smallpox inoculation before the West discovered it. Quote, Wherever one looked, there was first after first, end quote. 
It was while trying to find out more about the Nineveh number that I wrote to John Mitchell to ask his opinion. For in his book, The Dimensions of Paradise, Mitchell had written, quote, The ancients regarded numbers as symbols of the universe, finding parallels between the inherent structure of numbers and all types of form and notion, end quote, by, by italics. And then another quote. They inhabited a living sacred science universe, a creature of divine fabrication, designed in accordance with reason. End quote. I'm going to stand up for a minute. I won't make you look at my crotch, though. Nobody wants to look at that. Um, okay, Mitchell's reply launched me upon one of the most astonishing stages of this investigation so far. He pointed out, to begin with, that the Nineveh number is also divisible by the diameter of the sun, 864,000 80, miles, and the diameter of the moon, 2,160 miles, as well as the Earth's processional cycle. He added, quote, also by the numbers 1 to 10 and by their product, 3,628,800, end quote. He went on to point out, another quote here, there are certain nodal numbers, e.g. 86,400, and the number of seconds, oh, the number of seconds in a 24-hour day, and 864,000 miles, which is the sun's diameter. He went on to recommend that I read the chapter on number and measure in the dimensions of paradise. Let's see, before I go on, I think... Okay, there's exactly 300 pages. I was going to get about halfway and then take a little bit of a break. So bear with me a moment. Okay. He went on to recommend that I read the chapter Number and Measure in the Dimensions of Paradise. I turned to this and at first found it rather confusing, full of long numbers and decimals, such as the information that the Roman cubit is equal to one point four five nine eight one four four English feet, the Greek cubit to one point five two zero six four English feet, and the Egyptian cubit to one point seven two eight English feet. All this reminded me of Henry Lincoln's discoveries about Earth's measurements, see chapter ten. Uh, but I could not quite see the relevance of these decimals. Some of his statements certainly made me pay attention. Quote, Dividing the equator into 360 degrees makes each degree equal to 365,243.22 feet, or the number of days in a thousand years. That certainly is amazing, but then surely has to be a coincidence. But when I came to the tables relating the Greek, Roman, Hebrew, and Egyptian measures, my hair began to prickle. There could be no doubt that the units were exact divisions of the Earth's polar circumference. This was so startling, startling that I took the book down to a, a, allow my thought. I put the book down to allow my thoughts to settle. I already knew that according to Agatharchides of Nidus, the base of the Great Pyramid was one eighth of a minute of a degree of the Earth's circumference, demonstrating that the ancient Egyptians knew the exact size of the Earth. John Mitchell's figures went further in showing that Greek, Roman, Egyptian, and Hebrew measurements were all based on the size of the Earth. It demonstrated that all were part of the same ancient tradition. 
but if the sun's diameter in miles is a multiple of the number of seconds in a day, then it looks as if the Sumerians who invented or inherited the second also knew the sun's exact diameter. <coughs> Excuse me. Moreover, in a section on astronomy, John Mitchell goes on to show that the circumference of the moon, the earth, the sun, the moon's orbit around the earth, and the earth's orbit around the sun can also be divided precisely by 12 to the power of 7, and concludes that ancient philosophers, quote, established that number in feet as the measure of the moon's circumference and made it the astronomical standard measure of the universe, end quote. If this is true, it implies, as Henry Lincoln also believes, that the present tendency to get rid of the foot in favor of the meter may be a disastrous mistake. I began to see that what he meant in his accompanying letter by the statement, quote, We are dealing here with an entire organic cosmic code of number which structures the universe, not just odd coincidences, end quote. Now all these numbers cited by Mitchell belong to what he calls the canon, and a good starting point for understanding his ideas is a strange work called The Canon by William Sterling, published in London in 1897. Although that remarkable adventurer R.B. Cunningham Graham wrote an introduction, the book was totally ignored. The author later committed suicide. John Mitchell was responsible for getting the canon republished in 1974. I'll have to look for that. At first sight, the canon seems to be a typical crank work. It claims that the initiates of ancient mystery religions were taught certain cosmic laws upon which the stability of society depends. These laws were expressed in the number in the form of numbers and these numbers could also be encoded as names for in greek and hebrew each letter of the alphabet is also associated with a number this is known as gematria john mitchell insists that all of this contains a truth that has been forgotten that can be found in many ancient writings the starting point of the dimensions of paradise is plato's laws with its statement that the priests of Egypt possessed a canon or set of laws of proportions and harmonies that was thousands of years old. Plato used this canon in the measurements for his ideal city, which he called Magnesia. But these numbers and proportions were not Plato's invention, for as Mitchell shows very convincingly, they are also to be found in the plan, plan of Stonehenge and later in the New Jerusalem in the book of Revelation. Perhaps the easiest way of explaining what Mitchell means by his canon of numbers is to refer back to the golden section. It will be recalled that this springs out of the Fibonacci series in which every number in the sum is the sum of the two preceding numbers, 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, and so on. Every number is divided by its predecessor. Uh, every number divided by its predecessor comes close to pi, or sorry, phi, 0.618, and the bigger the numbers, the closer it gets. What is so amazing is that this simple series turns out to describe all kinds of natural phenomena, from seashells to spiral nebula. And when Mitchell points out that one degree of the Earth's equator in feet is equal to the number of days in a thousand years, he is citing one of many such coincidences that seems to hint at a secret number code of incalculable age. But the implication that this has been known for thousands of years suggests that some ancient cultures with an awesome knowledge of mathematics and astronomy existed at some time in the distant past. Maurice Chatelain's suggestion of 65,000 years no longer seems so absurd. We also saw when discussing Berriman's historical metrology 
in chapter 10 that the Greek stayed implies an exact knowledge of the Earth's polar circumference, yet the Greeks did not know the Earth's size until 240 BC when Eratosthenes made his calculation. Again, it looks as if this knowledge must have come from some far more remote period. John Mitchell's observation that the canon can be found in the geometry of Stonehenge again gives rise to a fascinating speculation. Alexander Tom talked about the architects of megalithic circles as prehistoric Einsteins, but he thought that they simply displayed incredible geometrical talent in constructing their stone calendars. If Mitchell is correct, it would be far more than that. It could be far more than that. It could simply be that the Stone Age Einsteins had inherited an ancient cosmic knowledge that stretches back beyond any known civilization. The Nineveh number and the Quirigi numbers are also part of that canon. The cosmological anthropic principle was formulated in 1974 by the astronomer Brandon Carter of the Paris Observatory. It begins by throwing doubt on the assumption of, the, of most scientists that man is merely a biological accident with no privileged position in the universe. What Carter pointed out was that whether life is a biological accident or not, one thing is clear, that in creating life, the universe has created observers who can, who can examine it. And that in one respect is in which we and that, sorry, and that is one respect in which we can regard ourselves as privileged without deception. Other scientists entered the debate. The astronomer Fred Hoyle, for example, pointed out the, in the intelligent universe that our planet just happens to be suited to the incubation of life. If the sun was a few degrees hotter or colder, there would be no life. Considered from that point of view, the whole universe seems to be oddly well suited to life, almost unreasonably so. For example, to make carbon, which is essential for life, two helium atoms have to collide, and he compared the chance of this happening to two billiard balls colliding on a billiard table the size of the Sahara Desert. And then the new atom has to attract a third helium atom to make carbon. But if a fourth helium atom joins the fray, then it converts into oxygen. In theory, all the carbon in our universe ought to have been converted into oxygen, rendering it barren. But this does not happen because the processes involved are subtly out of tune. So only half the carbon gets converted into oxygen. It looks, as Hoyle once said, as if some superintendent has been monkeying with the physics. Hoyle also pointed out that if it depended on the laws of chance, life would never have been created. It would have taken billions of times longer than the age of our universe. There is as little chance of life being created by accident, Hoyle says, as if the rusty car parts in a junkyard somehow began being blown together to create a new Rolls Royce. Brandon Carter extended his end anthropic principle to the statement that not only did the universe create life, but because of the physics involved, it had to create life. And this is not theological wishful thinking, but rigorous scientific logic. Okay, at that point, I am going to take a break and um, guzzle some water and suck on a cough drop because my throat just does not like these um, long reading sessions, but I'm not giving up. We're finishing this tonight. So I will be back in eh, about five minutes. We'll, we'll go for 1030. I'll be back. Feels like we are on a tight road. Treading lightly, oh, but I know I still want you with me. Even when it's not easy Feels like we are on the edge now Wish somebody would tell me how To get us to safety Cause I need you baby Cause I will make it right Right Yeah I am by your side Side I don't wanna let go, let go of all these memories in my mind. I don't want a goodbye tonight, no, no. All I want is a good time. 
like we are on a tight road Treading lightly, oh, but I know I still want you with me Even when it's not easy Feels like we are on the edge now Wish somebody would tell me how To get us to safety Cause I need you, baby Cause I around but everything is breaking us down i still need you with me more than ever now baby feels like this is phasing out now i know we can mix it up somehow no matter what you do just know i'll always be right next to you cause i We are on a tight road Treading lightly, oh, but I know I still want you with me Even when it's not easy Feels like we are on the edge now Wish somebody would tell me how To get us to safety Cause I need you, baby Cause I will make it right around but everything is breaking us down i still need you with me more than ever now baby feels like this is phasing out now i know we can mix it up somehow no matter what you do just know i'll always be right next to you cause i
like we are on a tight road Treading lightly, oh, but I know I still want you with me Even when it's not easy All right, let's get back to our book. We've got 15 pages to go. So he's got to pull it all together and tell us all about Atlantis and the kingdom of the Neanderthals in 15 pages. <laughs> I'm kind of doubting he's going to do it, but we'll see. He's mentioned them a little bit at least. All right. So the last thing we read was... Um, Not theological wishful thinking, but rigorous scientific logic. Okay, but then we may feel with certain philosophers like Bergson that the universe did not create life. Life was already there, so to speak, outside our universe and was has spent the past 15 billion years or so somehow inserting itself into matter. And we have also noted the discovery of Sir... Chandra Bose that even metals exhibit certain properties of living things. The anthropic principle seems to be implicit in Jeremy Narby's view of the Quirishana, who claim they can enter a visionary state in which they see these properties. Is it possible that the that Geth's Description of nature, quote, God's living gar garment, end quote, is literally true, that the universe is actually alive. In that case, perhaps the universe has a group mind which controls us as if we were cells in a living body. Perhaps the whole assumption of science in the past two centuries that we are living in a purely mechanical universe is just an immense misconception. This, according to John Mitchell, is the principle that underlies the cosmological canon. In Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings, Hapgood had already concluded it is a mistake to take, take it for granted that civilization implies steady upward progress. The anthropic principle suggests that there is an underlying pattern both in the universe and in number itself. And there is also a clear implication that this pattern or canon was known long before the present cycle of civilization that began with Jericho. Therefore, our civilization was not the first. Rand Flem Ath's study of geodesics led him to the same recognition of an underlying pattern that stretches far back into the past. In Fingerprints of the Gods, Graham Hancock had reviewed the evidence that points to a far older civilization and had even speculated on Antarctica as its source. Rand Flem Ath's blueprint with its recognition that so many sacred sites fall into a neat numerical pattern aligned to the Giza meridian goes far beyond this. Moreover, its use of the grid based on 360 degrees, an invention usually attributed to the Sumerians, seems to leave little doubt that the circle was divided into 360 degrees thousands of years earlier. If Stan Gooch is correct in his assumption that the Neanderthal man had already created his own fairly complex culture, it is even conceivable that the 360 degree circle may have been originally may, may have been originally invented by Neanderthals. Got an extra bin in that sentence. But how could such knowledge come to be lost? Procession of the equinoxes had to be rediscovered by Hipparchus from old star charts. The Nineveh number of the Quiriga and the Quiriga numbers make it quite clear that someone in the remote past knew as much about our solar system as we do. They also knew the precise length of the year's circumference. Length precise length of the Earth's circumference, which had to be rediscovered by Eratosthenes, the librarian at Alexandria. It is highly probable that such ancient knowledge of metrology and the cosmological canon was destroyed when the library was burnt, but the destruction of one single library hardly seems to explain how such an enormous amount of knowledge, including 
that embodied in the old portal ends was lost. We have touched on a possible answer several times in this book. For example, the mentally subnormal twins who can nevertheless swap 25 figure primes. According to Oliver Sacks, they can also name what day of the week any date in history fell on. Asked what was the 10th of December 50,008 BC, they can reply instantly a Tuesday. It would seem that some brains have an extremely peculiar kind of wiring and storage capacity, and the fact that this is so often found in children and idiot savants suggests that it may be a capacity that modern man has allowed to deteriorate. This in turn suggests it is something to do with our development of left brain consciousness with its linear logic, which in turn implies that we may have lost this ancient knowledge when we developed our dominant left hemisphere. So when we ask how the Assyrians or their predecessors discovered the 15-digit Nineveh number, the answer may be they didn't have to. Their mathematical prodigies may simply have seen it as easily as Sachs twins see 25-digit primes. And this could also explain how the pyramid builders knew the exact size of the Earth and probably the Moon, Sun, and the rest of the planets. It was part of the canon everybody took for granted. The gloomy conclusion would seem to be that modern man with his highly developed left hemisphere has simply lost one of the most important parts of his mental abilities. However, this inference might be premature. It is true that left brain consciousness is a pen and paper mentality, but it is possible to store an enormous amount of knowledge on paper and to do vast calculations with a pen. With the aid of his pen and paper, man has created the most complex civilization the earth has ever known. What the brain has lost in instant calculating power, he has made up for with computers. This has one major drawback, that modern life needs an almost a obsessive degree of narrow, fixed attention, the worm's eye view. We are like blinkered horses, scarcely seeing beyond the end of our noses. And because we are trapped in close upness, our civilization has an unprecedentedly high rate of suicide and mental instability, for close upness deprives us of meaning, which is essential to mental health. Didn't expect him to go there. Uh, in a word, modern man has lost the sense of freedom, which is so natural to a right brainer, trapped in a round that reduces him to a kind of robot, he has lost the bird's eye view. This problem has preoccupied Western thinkers since Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who suggested that the answer was for man to turn his back on civilization and go back to nature. In the same spirit, the philosopher Heidegger began his career by advocating the rejection of technology, and in the 1980s, a man who called himself the Unabomber and tried to start his own revolution by sending partial bombs to industrialists made it clear to everyone that this kind of response to complexity is dangerously simplistic. I've always recognized that there is another kind of solution to the problem of the worm's eye view. It is the real subject of my first book, The Outsider. I'm going to stand up again. <laughs> Not like in the chair tonight. On December 22, 1849, the 70, the 27-year-old novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky was taken out of prison to the Semyonovsky Square in St. Petersburg and sentenced to death by firing squad. His offense was circulating banned literature. He and his fellow revolutionaries were dressed in coarse linen shirts and lined up out opposite the soldiers. Then as the officer gave the order to fire, a horseman galloped on to the square to announce that their sentences had been commuted to life in Siberia. Dostoevsky was untied and taken back to prison. One of his fellow prisoners went insane. Before this brush with death, 
Dostoevsky had been inclined to paranoia and self-pity. Facing a firing squad had the effect of raising him above triviality and turning him into a great writer. What had happened was simply that he had been made aware of his freedom. To be alive, even in, even in Siberia, was to be free. The blinkers had been removed long enough to become aware of the reality behind them. This new insight was reflected in a letter to his brother immediately after the reprieve. Quote, Whatever one's misfortunes, not to despair and not to fall, that is the aim of life. End quote. It was his sense of reality that had been strengthened by his brush with death, what the psychologist Pierre Jeannet uh, calls his reality function. This recognition of choice of free will is oddly enough the essence of the left brain mentality. Split brain physiologists have noted that the left brain is more optimistic than the right. Most ancient peoples who were natural right-brainers saw themselves as creatures whose aim is to please their gods or God. When Western man became a left-brainer and lost his contact with the gods, he had to learn to stand on his own feet. This can be hard, for he often feels that he is stagnating in a meaningless world when life seems an endless struggle to stay alive. But this is counterbalanced by the moments when he experiences a typical left brain sense of purpose, the sheer optimism of the spring morning feeling, when anything seems possible. In such moments, he catches a glimpse of the answer, not to return to the less demanding consciousness based on harmony with nature, but of transcending left brain consciousness in a new sense of vital control. The next step in human evolution will be man's discovery of how to open and close the valve that enables us to build up great pressure of consciousness. What we call consciousness is that pressure. At this stage in our evolution, this is difficult to grasp because the worm's eye view makes us defeat, defeat prone. Yet whenever we experience what one philosopher has called the quote, the source of power, meaning, and purpose, end quote, we recognize clearly that this, that that is the only way forward and that this is the path we have to take whether we like it or not. However, while a return to the right brain consciousness of the past is neither possible nor desirable, it is impossible to overemphasize the importance of knowledge of this past. It can make us aware of precisely how far we have come, and more importantly, where we have to go next. Certain awkward questions about that past still require answers. In Ancient Traces, Michael Bejant devotes a chapter to doubts about how long man has been on Earth. For example, he tells how, after the Great California Gold Rush of 1849, miners found themselves unearthing baff baffling artifacts such as a stone pestle wedged tightly in a nine million year old level of rock or an iron nail embedded in a chunk of gold bearing quartz that was known to be 38 million years old. If there had been only a few of these anomalies, they could have been dismissed as hoaxes or as objects buried in Indian graves that had somehow found their way down to a deeper level. But there were hundreds of them. In 1874, an archaeologist named Frank Calvert found a mastodon bone engraved with a horned beast and a number of other figures. But that came from a Miocene bed more than 25 million years old, so the engravings could not have been the work of man. In June 1891, an Illinois housewife found a fine gold chain when she broke open a lump of coal. Half the chain remained in the coal, which was around 3 million years old. All of those anomalous things uh, were mentioned in um, Forbidden Archaeology, which I don't know that I will ever read that book on this stream. That is a tough book to get through. It's 900 pages of really dry reading. But maybe, maybe someday. In 1922... A mining engineer named John Reed discovered the fossil of the 
rear half of a human shoe, with stitching visible. Columbia, New York, professors agreed that the rock was from the Triassic era more than 213 million years ago. They also agreed that the fossil looked remarkably like a human shoe. But for the sake of keeping the argument within boundaries, we can all accept, let us assume that the conventional view that man has been on Earth perhaps three million years is correct. According to this view, the first human ancestor, Homo erectus, appeared around two million, uh, between 2 million and 1.5 million years ago. The polished plank described at the beginning of this chapter may be evidence that he was rather more intelligent than we we gave, give him credit for. One of the main suggestions of the last two chapters is that man probably developed a high level of intelligence long before he came we came along, and that one of the manifestations of his intelligence was the ability to handle enormous numbers. We have no idea when his when this evolutionary advance came about, but if Homo erectus had developed language and the ability to build rafts, then he may also have been the first true calculator. Stan Gooch argues that Neanderthal man possessed this ability and that Cro-Magnon somehow picked it up from him. Again, we have no way of knowing except that the evidence of metrology suggests that knowledge of the cosmic canon stretches back into the remote past. For the picture that begins to emerge is of the possibility of highly intelligent human ancestors who lived more than 100,000 years ago. They left behind few signs of their achievement because they were right-brainers whose technology was primitive. Nevertheless, their grasp of cosmology may have been far greater than that of the average educated man of today. In due course, Cro-Magnon man appeared on the scene for practical purposes about 40,000 or so years ago. The evidence he left behind suggests to us that he was a primitive caveman. In fact, his level of intelligence was probably as great as ours, which would explain why, at the end of the last ice age, such men were ready to create the first real, i.e. technological, civilization. These men also learned the existence of a cosmological canon that seemed to embrace the solar system. Now a 12,000-year-old civilization is one thing, a system of numbers, harmonies, and proportions that embraces the solar system quite another, at which point I came upon this passage in a book written in 1908, quote, Some of the beliefs and legends which have come down to us from antiquity are so universal and deep-rooted that we are accustomed to consider them almost as old as the race itself. One is tempted to inquire how far the unsuspected ap aptness of some of these beliefs and sayings is the result of mere chance or coincidence, and how far it may be evidence of a wholly unknown an unsuspected ancient civilization of which all other relic has disappeared." End quote. The writer of these words was not some follower of Madame Blavatsky or Rudolf Steiner, but, but the physicist Frederick Soddy, 1877 to 1956, a colleague of Ernest Rutherford, who is best known for his discovery of isotopes in 1913. In the interpretation of radium, Saudi goes on to talk about the Philosopher's Stone, quote, which was accredited with the power not only of transmuting metals, but as acting as an elixir of life, end quote. And he asks, quote, was then this old association of the power of transmutation with the elixir of life merely a coincidence? I prefer to believe it may be an echo from one of the many pre previous epochs in the unrecorded history of the world, of an age when men which have trod bef before the road we are treading today in a past possibly so remote that even the very atoms of civilization literally have had time to disintegrate, end quote. It is odd that in 1908, a scientist of Saudi's eminence felt no embarrassment at suggesting ideas that no contemporary scientist would dare to utter. But then he was living at a time before there was an 
impassable gulf between science and imagination. Nowadays, such, such speculations must be left to those with no academic reputation to lose. One such is John Mitchell, who concluded an article on the canon and may be left to conclude this book with the words, quote, This is not just a vague prescription. You can study the mathematic, mathematical proofs for yourself, and the more you do so, the more clearly you will see the truth in Plato's reassurance Things are far better taken care of than we can possibly imagine, end quote. And that's actually the end of the last chapter, but there is an appendix, um, like six pages here, eight pages, eight pages, um, yeah, so I'm going to get into it and see what it has to say. Um, and that will finish out the book. So the appendix is titled Atlantis in Cyprus. In August 2004, I received a phone call from a travel agent named Roy Bird, who organizes trips to exotic places. He told me that an American named Robert Sarmast was about to set out on an expedition from Limassol, Cyprus, with the aim of trying to locate Atlantis. He asked me what I thought of the notion that Atlantis might be found in that area, and I replied that I could think of nothing less likely. Plato had said that Atlantis was beyond the Pillars of Hercules, which are generally accepted to be the Straits of Gibraltar. Professor Galanopoulos, the chief advocate of the theory that the island of Santorini, midway between Crete and the mainland to the north, argued that two capes of southern Greece, Malleus and Tenarum were also known as the Pillars of Hercules, but as far as I could see, there was no possible way in which the island of Cyprus in the extreme eastern Mediterranean could be beyond the Pillars of Hercules on either interpretation. That, said Roy Bird, was not quite true. According to Sarmast, the ends of the Bosphorus were also known as the Pillars of Hercules, and if you were looking at these from Greece, you would be looking due east, and Cyprus would indeed be beyond them. I had to admit that if Atlantis was in the Mediterranean, it would explain another puzzle, Plato's assertion that the Atlanteans had been at war with the Athenians. If Atlantis had been somewhere out in the Atlantic Ocean, or even as my fellow author Rand Flemath had suggested, on the continent of Antarctica, there could be no remote possibility of a war between nations so far apart. The reason Roy Bird was ringing me was that he hoped I might interest the Daily Mail in the story and tempt a few hundred tourists to pay cash to join the expedition. I rang a friend on the mail features who liked the idea and asked me to write an article about it, which is what I did. However, the newspaper decided not to print the address of my website, giving details of how potential customers could pay their money. And so, from Roy Bird's point of view, the whole exercise was a waste of time. But by then, I had, not, I had got a hold of Sarmast's book, The Discovery of Atlantis, the startling case for the island of Cyprus, and was so intrigued by his theory that I decided to take a holiday to Cyprus with my wife and look into it myself. We had a friend who had re retired to Limassol, the psychic Robert Cracknell, and this would give us an opportunity to go and visit him. He obliged obligingly booked us into a beach hotel in Limassol, and so in September we flew to L Larnaca and were met off the plane by Bob and his wife, Jenny. From our hotel, we rang Sarmast, who was staying in Limassol, and invited him to dinner the following day. We had already been told that the expedition would not sail on time due to various problems to do with obtaining permits, so we did not expect to be able to sail on the ship. In fact, it had begun to look as if it might be months before it set out. But the following evening, when Sarmast arrived at our hotel for an early drink, he told us that things had suddenly improved dramatically and that it now looked as if they would be leaving that weekend. 
Sarmast was a good-looking guy in his late 30s, born in Iran, but having spent most of his life in America, where his family had fled to escape the rule of the Ayatollah Khomeini. As we sat on the terrace overlooking the swimming pool and drank cold beer, he told me about his background and how he had become interested in Atlantis. When he left university, he had felt that his priority was to find himself, and he had taken a one-way ticket to India to avoid the temptation of changing his mind. There he found various gurus, but ended, ended by feeling basically dissatisfied. His story reminded me of so many religious outsiders I have written about. For example, Peter Ospensky, who uh, went to India before the First World War in search of a guru who could teach him the meaning of life, but failed to find him until he returned to Russia and met Gurdjieff. In Robert Sarmast's case, the search continued after his return to America. One of the things he came across was a teaching that identified Atlantis with the biblical Eden, and it was in pursuing this odd clue that he came to feel that Eden had been to the east of Lebanon. In the days when the Mediterranean was far lower than it is today, and when the island of Cyprus had been joined to the mainland. Like Galanopolis, he had concluded that Plato's figures had been exaggerated by the copyist. Even Plato expresses doubts about them. By mistaking the symbol for ten for the very sim similar symbol for a hundred, and we're around ten times too large, he goes on to point out. One, Plato says that the fertile plain was used by farmers to grow food for the Atlanteans, but that it that is about half the size of England and would certainly provide more food than any city could eat, even London. Two, Plato says there was a rectangular ditch around the whole plain into which several rivers were diverted to collect drinking water, but that would provide enough water for ten cities. Three, Plato says that the plain contained a harbor consisting of concentric circles of canals, all 100 feet deep and 300 feet wide. But who would want to dig a canal that deep? A 100 feet is the size of five average house, houses piled on top of each other, of one another, and no doubt would have that much draft, or even a quarter of it. As to that enormous width, it would take half a dozen aircraft carriers. Whew. There's that lack of oxygen again. I'm trying to breathe more. So anyone can see that these figures would be more convincing if divided by 10. Besides, said Sarmast, maps show a vast undersea plain 23 miles long by 34 miles wide. Knock off two knots from Plato's Atlantis plane and you have these exact dimensions. Okay, page 296. There are exactly 300 pages, so we're getting there. He managed to persuade some French oceanographic project to let him have a small section of their recent survey of the seabed recovering uh, sorry, covering that area and found a hill in the exact spot where Plato's Acropolis Hill should have been and what appeared to be a long wall at its foot. Again, as Plato described. In fact, as Plato said, the whole hill seemed to be boxed in by walls as far as one could judge from surveys taken a mile deep. Later in the restaurant, Robert showed us a computer simulation of the sea breaking through the mountain barrier that once separated Gibraltar from North Af Africa. Now it was during the 1960s that geologists first learned that the Earth's surface is not a continuous sheet, like the skin of an orange, but consists of tectonic plates that move about separately. Then scientists learned that the Mediterranean is a fairly young sea that was created about 7 million years ago when the plate containing Africa drifted north and collided with Europe. The sea was trapped 
into a kind of gigantic pond which extended from Gibraltar to Lebanon. That's completely different than a de uh, the theory Graham Hancock puts forth. Uh, gradually, this pond evaporated in the hot sun until the floor of the basin was covered with gleaming salt flats. Geologists have always assumed that the Atlantic began to break through a gap near Gibraltar five million or so years ago, as stated earlier in this book. But since salt beds cannot be carbon dated, no one knows exactly when. All we know is that the last great ice age began about 115,000 years ago and came to an end about 15,000 years ago. But we do know there have been many tremendous floods since it ended. As vast northern lakes mel melted and poured billions of gallons of fresh water into the sea. Plato, of course, stated that Atlantis was submerged 9,000 years before his own time, which would make it about 9400 BC. Sarmash suggests that this was when the melting ice caused the Atlantic to force a new gap in the mountain barrier between Gibraltar and North, America, North Africa and into the island-dotted salt lake we now call the Mediterranean. But at first, the sea broke through only in one place, and the lake remained lower than the Atlantic. Okay, now he's touching on the theory Graham Hancock and Randall... can't remember his name, sorry, uh, have been putting forth. Um, it was according to Sarmas, during this period, while the Mediterranean was still protected by a range of low mountains, and the peninsula we now call Cyprus had turned into a huge island, about twice its present size, that a new civilization began to flourish in the eastern Mediterranean, Atlantis. The day after our dinner, Sarmas was having a press conference on board the ship, the Flying Enterprise, and we were invited, together with Bob and Jenny Cracknell, a television crew, interviewed Sarmast on the bridge, and I later did a short interview to, to camera for the local news, explaining why I thought it conceivable that this search for Atlantis, which was being partly financed by the government of Cyprus, partly for its anticipated effect on the tourist trade, might well produce interesting results. Uh, we also looked at the robot camera that could be used to scan at a depth of a mile. That weekend, Joy and I returned home. In fact, the flying Enterprise failed to leave Limassol the day it was supposed to, apparently still an account of, on account of permits. And I had more or less given up wondering what the expedition would set out when the expedition would set out, when on Sunday, November 14th, 2004, Bob Cracknell rang me from Cyprus to tell me that Sarmast had sailed the previous Monday and was now back in Limassol announcing that he had found Atlantis, or something very like it. I lost no time in ringing Sarmast, who told me he had a press conference in an hour, but would ring me back later in the day. He kept his promise and I recorded the conversation. It seemed that in spite of initial difficulties, the flying enterprise had reached the area of the Temple Mount, then released the sonar device in, on three miles of steel cable, which was towed behind the ship about 50 feet above the seabed. Then the winch releasing the cable broke down and took a whole night to repair. This was done by technicians, one of whom had just returned from working on the Titanic. After another long day making long sweeps over the sea of the Temple Hill, the team went to bed very tired. Robert was awakened with the discouraging news that the generator which provided the energy for the winch had failed. It looked at, the, at that point as if the expedition was over and there was nothing to do but return to Limassol. But there was a problem. The cable was trailing three miles behind the ship, and without the winch could not be wound in. There was only one thing to do, to get another generator. This had to be brought from Limassol and was even bigger than the one that had broken down, which is about the size of a small room. 
and of course the ship had to keep moving otherwise a sonar device would sink down to the sea floor and might well get snagged on some obstacle so they continued to steam ahead waiting for the arrival of the ship the Ares, with the new generator when this finally happened both ships had to steer a parallel course side by side while the new generator generator was transferred to the deck of the flying enterprise on a steel cable sarmast said that he was terrified that if the cable snapped while the generator was swinging aloft it would fall and sink the ship finally the transfer was made and the new generator even bigger than the old one installed the Ares sailed back to Limassol while the flying Enterprise turned in a huge circle with its trailing cable and went back over the mound that they thought to be Plato's Acropolis Hill. What they were doing, in effect, was using the sonar to film long strips of seabed, but as Sarmas looked at the first results, he was discouraged. They seemed to show very little. When he went to bed that night, he had come to accept that the whole expedition had been a failure and that he was still no nearer to proving that the undersea mound was plato's acropolis hill he awoke to good news while he'd been asleep the technicians had been working on the long strips of map placing them side by side and what had finally emerged was a great hill about three kilometers long with a plateau on top and unmistakable signs of a great wall that surrounded it he had recognized the signs of a wall at the southern foot of the hill on the original sonar maps provided by the French, but experts he had consulted had told him it was probably a mudslide. He re replied that a mudslide that long and in a straight line was unlikely, but they had declined to be convinced. Now he had been proven proved right. I asked whether it might be possible to film the walls with the robot camera, but he pointed out that it at that depth around a mile it would be pitch black and that everything would be covered in a layer of mud two weeks later robert came to london and he and i appeared together in a television interview about his discovery as we ate dinner together in Ber bertorelli's in soho i asked him what happened now now he said we start the long slow business of raising millions of dollars for an expedition that can get down there on the seabed and see what we've really found. Have they in fact found Plato's sunken city? An element of skepticism in me suggests that this would be too good to be true, but whatever it is, Sarmast has found an unknown bit of human history. Postscript. In August 2005, the BBC web site published a recent discovery that seemed to confirm that Sarmast is correct. The story begins, quote, a submerged island that could be the source of the Atlantis myth was hit by a large earthquake and tsunami 12,000 years ago, a geologist has discovered, end quote. It goes on, quote, Spartel Island now lies 60 meters under the sea in the Straits of Gibraltar, but some think it once lay above water. The finding adds weight to the hypothesis that the island could have inspired the legend recounted by the philosopher Plato more than 2,000 years ago. Evidence comes from a seafloor survey published in the journal Geology. Mark andre Gutcher of the University of Western Brittany in Plouzane, France found a coarse grained sedimentary deposit that is 50 to 120 centimeters thick and could have been left behind after a tsunami. Dr. Gucher said that the destruction described by Plato is consistent with a great earthquake and tsunami similar to the one that devastated the city of Lisbon in, in Portugal in 1755, generating waves with heights of up to 10 meters. The thick turbidite deposit results from sediments that have been shaken up by underground geological upheavals. It was found to date to around 12,000 years ago, roughly the age indicated by Plato for the destruction of Atlantis, Dr. Gucher reports in Geology. 
Spartel Island in the Gulf of Cadiz, was proposed as a candidate for the origin of the Atlantis legend in 2001 by French geologist Jacques Colma Girard. It is in front of the Pillars of Hercules or the Straits of Gibraltar, as Plato described. Sedimentary records reveal that events like the 1755 Lisbon earthquake occur every 1500 to 2000 years in the Gulf of Cadiz. The report concludes but the mapping of the island carried out by Dr. Gusher failed to turn up any man-made structures and also showed that the island was much smaller than previously believed. This is only to be expect, uh, end quote. This is only to be expected. Spartel Island is too small to have been Plato's Atlantis. But if in 10,000 BC it exploded like the island of Santorini eight and a half mil millennia later, then it would have triggered a tsunami that would have devastated the, the southern part of the island of Cyprus. Sarmast understandably regards it as an extremely powerful piece of evidence for his Cyprus theory of Atlantis. And there we go. So, was it a bait and switch? Yes, it was. He did not put it all together. He did not show us what he was talking about with Atlantis and the kingdom of the Neanderthals. He talked about Atlantis a little bit. He talked about the Neanderthals being more advanced than we give him credit for, more intelligent. He did not put it together into that, which is very disappointing to me. But there was still a lot of interesting stuff in there. Um, he did write a good book, even though he baited us with the title um, but now that we are done we have come to a conclusion on what the next book is that I will start reading on Sunday um, and that is the temple and the lodge um, and you you may recognize the name Michael Bejant and Richard Lay they were mentioned a bunch of times in Atlantis and the Kingdom of the Neanderthal. So um, we are going to jump into that one Sunday and we'll see. Hopefully, um, yeah, well, we'll just see. There's nothing more to be said about it. I'm just going to put my bookmark in there where I'm starting and that'll be Sunday. So, um, it's late enough. I am not going to play. I was supposed to start Fallout 4 tonight, but I am not going to play um, for a 30 minutes and then have to shut it down to go to bed. So we will uh, see about... Uh, there's not really anybody around to raid. So we're just going to call it, and I will see you all tomorrow night for Star Wars and Resident Evil biohazard. Have a good night.
Oh, 